Yo, 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 what's up everybody? Thank you for tuning in to yet again another fantastic indie comic interview. It's your Caped Crusader Cody, and we are keeping it geekly with our brand new friend Richard Fairgray. And we're here to break down Haunted Hill and so much more from just his creation. Like you have how many books out already? It's 258. Wow, geez, that is insane. And that's not even, you, you've you worked on like a lot of different projects too. I know last night we were in a space, you were talking about like having like influences on Wolver Wolverine or something like that, right? I mean, yeah, I was being really way too public about, about behind the well, scenes. Well, we don't have to I dive had. into that. I'm just saying you've had your it hands was fine. It's, it's fine. It in was, a lot of pods. It was one of those, you know when, you know when you, um, you know when it's the year of our Lord 2000 and eight and you're you're on the the silver daddies.com chat rooms the java chat and you meet a nice man and you fall deeply in love and then he's like why don't you come and live with me in australia <laughs> and i'll get you a job as my assistant on the wolverine movie and you're like sure why not throw my entire life away for that turned out to be secretly married um <laughs> <laughs> one what a twist situations. what a twist oh my god you know when you're you know when you're living with someone and you wake up early and you find them on skype with their actual husband who's still back in la and they're like arranging to get a piano moved into the house and you're like oh dip you're not moving here at all never i could say i've never had that happen <laughs> you do not spend enough time on silverdaddies.com obviously <laughs> So what led you into creating comics? Like, how did we get here? You know, what was like your first like footsteps into it? I thought they didn't exist. Um, I was like, I'd seen them in TV shows. Like I knew that Bart Simpson and Michelangelo read comic books, mm -hmm. but I grew up in New Zealand where we didn't have comic book stores. I think we had four comic stores um, in the whole country. Um, and so I just, I, I really had never seen a comic book. And so I thought, well, these things used to exist. I bet if I started making them, I'd be the only person in the whole world doing it, and I'll probably be like a millionaire. Um, and it, it worked perfectly, um, you know, and, and I'm actually a multi-millionaire. These are not glasses. It's two separate monocles stuck together. I'm so rich. No, I um, I just started, I started, like, making them. I, like, I understood what the format was. Mm -hmm. Like, I'd seen pictures of comic books, and I'd seen comic strips. We had one comic strip in our, in our like, I was going to say our local paper, but our actual only national paper at that point. Uh, it's a very small country. Um, and so I, I just started drawing these things. And then uh, my school was uh, introducing VHS tapes to the library. And it had been this huge fight. And a lot of people were really opposed to it. But this one librarian had really pushed for it. And I was like, well, she's the weak link here. So I realized they had the same sticker barcode things on them as the... Uh, local video store so i got some other kids to get videos out from the school library for free but i paid the kids to do it mm -hmm. and then they gave them all to me 12 tapes in total i took them into the local video store slid them underneath the the sensors took them into the adult section swapped out the tapes and then returned them to the library um they got scanned back in with their new you know altered stickers um, but they were put back on the shelves and they're, they're all, it was all porn. And I went into the library and I said to the librarian, who I won't name because I promised I never would. And I'm breaking a lot of other promises here. And I said, I will, I, I like, there's porn in your library. I will never do this again if you give me a free photocopy. And she didn't believe me. So I just walked over to what looked like a random shelf and grabbed a tape that I had queued up to a particularly hardcore scene and I shoved it in the player and just stood there and stared at her. Oh my while, God, uh, you are evil. That is such a genius idea. So I got free <laughs> photocopying and so I started printing my comics and I had this book, Ghost Ghost, uh, which is actually being re-released next month. Um, uh, so I had this book, Ghost Ghost, about a little ghost who was sad because he was invisible and no one mm -hmm. was scared of him. Uh, and so uh, I sold it at a school athletic today and and the money, I, I tell everyone that I bought Ninja Turtles with the money, but I bought Power Rangers because I was not that cool. The Power um, Rangers are cool. Were they? I thought they were awesome, dude. Are you, man, OG Power Rangers, like when they first started? Yeah, look. When our boy busted out the flute, started playing the flute through the helmet, that wasn't, that That, that didn't mean anything to you? Okay, but see, you're, you're pointing out exactly what's wrong with it. A, a boy playing a flute through a helmet. 
I was a child during that time, Richard. Oh, was I? <laughs> also, the biggest, the biggest robot they had was the slowest moving, dumbest one. Like, oh, cool, it's, it's Titanus from Titan, the third moon of Saturn. I guess he's gonna show up and crawl toward the things. Single, no single handedly ruining my childhood in one interview. My point is that Ninja Turtles <laughs> is better. Ninja Turtles hit everything. Have no, I seen, I, I, I seen a, a really interesting argument where people got upset about uh, the third movie because they became samurais. They weren't like ninjas anymore. You mean last night? You and I talking about this last night? Yes, yes. Was <laughs> it you? <laughs> yes, dude. I, 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 man, I need to stay out of those spaces, dude. I, I thought I was dreaming there for a second. You're like, speak of the devil. Oh, Look, man, that I, was such a good movies, space. Those movies are absolute dump. But, um... But that TV show, like I can still dip back in on classic Ninja Turtles any any day of the week. Mm -hmm. um, and like the show just got better. Like like the 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 uh, I don't know the 2003 series is a mixed bag, shall we say? Um, but like the 2012 series absolutely slaps. I have not seen Rise of the TMNT yet because it is but ugly. Mm -hmm. But um, people keep telling me it's pretty good. So. I haven't really seen a lot of the new T Ninja Turtle, but um, I did get my hands on The Last Ronin. and I haven't read it yet, but I've been really, really interesting in finishing it because I heard it was really sad and really good. Yeah, I I haven't read it yet. I bought, I was like, I'm gonna wait till the end and read the whole thing. And then a friend of mine was doing it. I was watching an interview with my friend last week and he is, there's a character in it named after him. And the first thing he did in the interview was spoil it. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh damn it, David. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so And like it, it makes sense. Like it's it's something that I think I could have predicted from about page two. Mm -hmm. Um but like you never know anymore, you know? Like and I that shock I, value. That shock value feels good when you get the initial reaction to it. I used to be someone who didn't care at all about spoilers. Like I'm you know, I love reading the back of a, 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 a I was about to say a VHS. I love reading the back of a streaming service, because I'm modern. Um, to find out what's going to happen. I love, like, I love watching a film and looking forward to a scene that I've already heard about. Mm -hmm. Um, but, like, the older I get, the more excited I start. Like, I'm, I'm becoming, I'm becoming, like, what I was meant to be as a teenager at the moment, I think. Because, like, like, you know, Scream 5 was, well, let's be honest, Scream 5 was some pretty hard work and some heavy heavy sweaty dialogue for the first half but then it really picked up once they killed off dewey finally um spoiler uh but like now i'm theorizing about scream six i never thought i'd be a person with theories about a movie and that's when a movie's good when it gets you uh thinking about what's coming next yeah i did actually i tried to watch the scream tv series and the first two seasons that are amazing and then they changed the entire cast and the setting and everything and it's just it's, it always ruins it, too, whenever they do that. It's like uh, Futurama. They're trying to get rid of Bender. Or the, uh, Joe DiMaggio wanted more money for his contract, and they didn't want to do that. So they were going to... The initial idea was to have Bender be able to have, like, a chip installed, and then he would just have different celebrity voices. But that I would, like, ruin the, Futurama. There's such a, there is a really good... I think what they should do with Futurama... There's time travel on that show, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. So they could erase themselves entirely from history, so I never have to watch Futurama. <laughs> like you can keep the dog episode i'll give you that you can oh keep my the God, dog that episode. so sad it was so but, sad oh, that show is that is that's that is a sweaty show i'll tell you that I, I i did like i did like uh the the part uh at the end with him and, and uh leela though when, when he had the what was the it the, uh, uh when it was like dripping and it wrote the i love you on the cave floor and stuff yeah like there are all the, okay. Futurama is one of those shows that has a lot of cool ideas in it, and then it still sucks. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, um, they. Oh my god, my cat! If I don't let her on my lap, she always yanks out my headphones. <laughs> it's her way of spiting me. Um, <laughs> so uh, they, they kept uh, getting canceled, or not knowing when they're going to get canceled, and then having to get like. So I think a lot of the juice is because like they lost the, the the fire for it. But I, you know, I don't know. Everyone has their own cup of tea, really. I, 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 like, here's the thing. I, I was so invested in Futurama when it was first on, and every single week, I'd watch it and be like, oh, that wasn't very good. Can't wait for next time. You know, like, I kept hoping it would be good, like The Simpsons used to be. Hold on one like, second. Hey, can, can you get the cat? Hold on, I gotta get, I gotta get her out of here. 
Please hold, viewers. No, she wants, to, she wants to hang out. Normally, normally she doesn't ever want to be touched or pet or even seen by me. But it's like whenever I go live, she always is trying to pull up on my lap and hop up here. She kept yanking out my headphones. Uh, sorry like about the, that. It's, I like to think that she wants to be an internet superstar. She does. Well, I have I have a big uh, chunky boy named uh, Miggy, and he he's my little mini hoss. But uh, I think he's probably snoozing somewhere. I just realized I, I never actually retweeted that tweet. Now that oh, it's you're going. fine. There's no worries. I'm just going to do it right now so people can come watch me. Yes, sir. Um, and then um, I can edit this little part part out in the post-production, too. No, no, people will want to see this. This is, the, this is the exciting part. They're seeing my glasses on. Yeah. They're seeing my wonky weird eyes. And it's like, <laughs> come check out my sexy new jacket. There we go. I have, I have, I, um, for the first time in my entire life, I've broken my phone screen. And I'm quite... <laughs> pissed about it because it's also the first time in my life where I bought a responsible case for my phone so that I wouldn't break it. So it's, <laughs> it's like I'm you like, tried to be pre pre preventative yeah. and it's like, nope. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I do hate this phone. I like, this is, it's the worst phone I've ever had. Um, uh, yeah. Don't, don't buy the pixel. It's terrible. But also weirdly, doesn't Google well. Really? So, yeah, like like it has real trouble with all of the Google. Based that program. is weird. It, you, you you think? Yeah, look look who's back. I think I'm just gonna let her chill on the lap now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I have, I have a dog who does the same, but she's at the other end of the house. Let's go ahead and let's dive back into it. Let's get back. Let's get back to it. So we were looking at your first comic creation. Do you want to give us a little recap of uh, what what was in that? You said you're uh, gonna be uh, re-releasing it soon. Um, yeah. So it's called Ghost Ghost. Um, it's about a ghost who struggles with invisibility and loneliness and a sense of alienation and being too smart for his own good and blah 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 and i did it when i was seven and that's a big concept for being seven. Oh, let me okay let me tell you let me tell you the first book i ever wrote um my parents were really insistent that i needed to learn to read and write before i went to kindergarten you start kindergarten at four in new zealand so i'm a three-year-old who can read and write and i'm like well i should start making books so I make this book, I think largely inspired by the popular hit video game where Mickey Mouse goes to a haunted house. But in my game, Donald and Mickey were meant to go to a haunted house together, but Mickey doesn't show up. So Donald goes into the house all by himself to look for ghosts, and in mm -hmm. the attic, he finds one. And the ghost is lonely because he has no friends. Donald is like, I don't have any friends either. I thought I did, but Mickey didn't turn up. So then Donald pulls out his gun and shoots himself in the face so that oh he my can stay God, be what? friends with the ghost forever. Shoo! <laughs> that took a twist. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. There's some copyright issues. I probably can't publish it. Wow, yeah, hey. Um... Like, I, I was this, I was, I used, I, I <clears throat> the, so, I took that, I took the book with me mm -hmm. because I thought, like, I have to prove that I can read and write when I start kindergarten. I get there and everyone's just eating their fucking Play-Doh. And I'm like, I made a book and then immediately I'm in trouble. Um, yeah. My parents get called in. Like, there's a whole, like, it's just, I'm like, oh, wow, all this attention. This is, oh my, I should do this more often. Mm -hmm. And so I just started making more and more books. And then uh, when I, we, it was Valentine's Day and I would have been almost five at this point. And we got told we had to draw a picture of people who were in love, which is a fucked up assignment for four yeah. and five year olds to have. Yeah. But whatever. It's Valentine's Day. They needed a theme. These people don't get paid well. And so everyone else drew their parents. And I drew Postman Pat and Reverend Tim's kissing. And it turns out when you draw two adult men kissing uh, as a four year old, you get in trouble again. <laughs> You're a celebrity in the principal office, huh? So I, um, like, I just, I just kind of, I got really hooked on like, oh, I, I don't like this is this. I, mean, I know the term good trouble means something very different, but like, this was the good kind of trouble for me. This was like, oh, books are the thing that will, like, everyone will know who I am because I'm the, mm -hmm. like, finally, I'm not the weirdo who picks his nose and keeps it in his pocket which I also was that. Um, <laughs> but like, like I had fucking pockets full of boogers. You just um, pockets full of them. <laughs> but I would... <laughs> 
And but like I could also be the guy who like made cool stories and people made definitely. Like, he's yeah. like he's like you love this character. He's blowing his face off. He's out of here. Yeah, <laughs> here's a booger. You love Donald Duck. <laughs> sure what happens to Donald Duck? Oh, so what came next after this? You know, well, what, let, let, let's start building uh, the footwork up to Haunted Hill. Okay, so then I, so I do I do Ghost Ghost when I'm seven. That's my first thing I publish. I then do a book called Bald Man, which is about a guy who's just bald and someone calls him a bald man one day. And he's like, people whose name ends in man are usually superheroes, so probably I am too. I think I was just ripping off Quail Man, to be honest, because his outfit was- Oh, from the uh, Doug? Much. Yeah, yeah, like very sleeveless vest situation going on for Bald Man. Um, and then, and that turned into the, like, this, it, it was like a 400 page fucking epic nonsense thing about him trying to take down some pop stars who are working for the government. Um, and then how old were you when you wrote epic. that? I would have started it when I was eight, but I think like it, it kind of just kept going in little bits until mm -hmm. I was like, 12, maybe. I remember I like, I dipped back into it when I was in high school and was like, like trying to figure out if there was any worth in it at all and then i was like there isn't so i went so then okay i had this idea i often get stuff like really wrong from real life like i get i there's a, this sort of disconnect where i will make a decision that something will work mm -hmm. and then i'll just go do it even though it clearly won't like like when i was a kid i would i was absolutely convinced that that because leather wallets i saw were selling for 17 dollars I was out somewhere with my dad, he needed a wallet, it was gonna cost him $17. And I was like, well, I have paper at home and I have a brown felt tip pen so I can color in the paper to make it look like leather. And then I could tape it together and make my own wallets and sell them for $17. And it would basically cost me nothing because as far as I know, pens are free. Mm -hmm. And so I just like sat there for like hours just coloring in pieces of paper brown. And then I taped them all together and looked at it. I was like, well, this doesn't look like a wallet. Damn, what went wrong? You know, like I, I remember I made a, I made, I spent all day, I was homesick from school and my mother was negligent and went out. Um, and so I made myself a Smurf costume being like, I'm gonna teach my mother a lesson. She's gonna come home tonight <laughs> and I'm gonna be wearing my Smurf costume that will be so accurate that she will believe that her nine year old son is gone and has been replaced by a Smurf. <laughs> so blue t-shirt, white pants, piece of white paper taped in a like cylinder around my head, mm -hmm. and then a paper plate that I colored in blue and cut eye holes in that I then taped to my hair. And I just sat there being like, man, this is gonna work super good. I like, I looked at a mirror. I looked at a mirror and was like, yep, I look exactly like It looked like good, a it looked good. It did not. <laughs> It's like when you uh, when you go to look back at like PlayStation One games after not playing them for fifteen years, and you're like, "Wow, like this used to look good." I mean, I would I would argue that uh, Crash Team Racing is still absolute perfection. Yeah, yeah. Are you playing on a, a CRT? Um, no, no. I'm playing it on a terrible, terrible. Uh, like, you know, I'm playing it on a nice TV, so it looks like absolute garbage. Yeah, hey, but you got you got to have that nice experience, right? The nice like surround sound from the TV and everything, and the pixel the pixels blown up like 50, 60 inches. Like, I get it. I just want to go back to the days when like someone would be like, "Hey, Richard, you want to come to my house? I have a twenty three inch screen," and you'd be like, "Shit, I gotta get like, there fast." And you'd all I got is nineteen inch. And you'd like you bring over your multi tap for your PS One, and then four of you could play Crash Team Racing together, mm -hmm. like literally all night long. And some of them like, you get the guess? no, I don't. I'll you get the little Crash six Team foot, Racing. the six foot extender for the controller, and then you can sit back on the couch from the TV. <laughs> Dude, I, I miss those comic. days. Those were the good days. About a decade ago, I was drawing a comic, and I put a scene in it where someone tripped over a, a cord to a controller, and my friend, who's a little bit younger than me, was like. What what is this? What are you doing? Do you honestly still believe controllers are plugged in? <laughs> now, I did because I didn't know that my controller could be unplugged. I thought the charging cable was the way that the controller mm -hmm. worked. So I was like that for uh, you know, I, I I have PS5 and everything, but for my Switch, I didn't think the controller worked without the plug. I didn't think it was like capable of holding the charge because sometimes like the cheaper controllers are like that. You know, you, if you unplug it, it doesn't work. But mine, like for the last two years, I didn't use and it was wireless. So my kid was playing it. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, how is this working like this? <laughs> I mean, I, I literally found out like 
maybe a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, that my keyboard for my computer does not need to be plugged in. That is also oh, that's nice. Table. Yeah, that is nice. I, I just I did I don't. I mean, okay, I know we have like remote controls for television, so I should have put it together, but. <laughs> I don't know. I like having everything plugged into each other. That way I don't mm -hmm. lose it. I, I won't use earbuds. I will always have my big overhead things with a cord. Yeah, I have mine too, but like with my ears, I'm stretching, I'm stretching them back out. So I can't like, I have these, but they cover my whole ear. So it like hurts my ear when I'm wearing my plugs and mm -hmm. uh, it just, it starts to mess them up. Um, but I totally get that. The, those are so much nicer than having like the little AirPods. I have the AirPods, but I would always prefer the better headset. I know that I would I would immediately lose them. Yeah, like, yeah, I've actually washed mine in the washer a couple of times. So, how did you start getting into Haunted Hill? Um, let, let, let's start bringing it back. All right, um, yeah. The concept for okay, Haunted so Hill, I mean, because it's a really interesting story, and I only got to read uh, the first two issues, uh, and you have, uh, you said you're coming out with your your eighth? Yeah, the eighth. I, I, I post six pages every Wednesday, um, so the eighth issue started today. Um... It's been running since January. Um, so, I mean, you know, fast forward through like literally hundreds of books and I dipped out for a second to make a couple of like feature films that were doomed. And then I worked as a stand-up comedian for a little bit. And then I kind of retired from comics because I had felt like I'd done everything I could do. And mm -hmm. you know, I was a 20 year old, so I was an asshole. Um, and I was like, I've conquered comics forever. I've made graphic novels. <laughs> um, and then, I, I came back because I had this st very stupid idea, but like I think stupid ideas done well are the best mm -hmm. um, for a book called Blastosaurus about a crime fighting triceratops. And then that kind of like launched me into doing it as like a proper grown up uh, and not just like I always thought that I'd have to quit and get a real job one day. And then when I finished college, I realized like I'm making more money from comics than I could possibly make in, a, in, a, in an adult job, you know? Um, because I've just been doing it for so long. I mean, when people say like, oh, how did you get successful? I mean, you just do it forever. And eventually people like people are just really used to giving you money for the book. So yeah, they keep yeah. Doing it, I guess one day well, they'll wake up. Building that, um, fol uh, that following uh, year after year. I mean, what's some of the different things you've done to like kind of accumulate that? Um, well, like, so, you know, I did, I did these books and I was just selling them at my school and photocopying them and things. And then. When I was 15, I started doing stand-up, and that got me like a little bit of an audience out in the real world. And so then I was able to like, I appeared on TV a few times for that. Um, and so then I was able to like say, hey, who wants to give me money to advertise in my book? And I like literally like pounded the pavement. I walked around like several different mm -hmm. cities going to like, I, I was like, if you're a weird clothing store that appeals to me, like in a country that doesn't have Hot Topic, um, then like you'll probably want to give me a hundred bucks and then i made the money to do like a nice print run of, of a of a book and i then uh i helped a guy carry a bunch of mac and cheese into a convention one time and then after that he it turns out he ran the convention and he started giving me a free booth for a couple of years oh um, wow that's awesome too I and mean, it turns out if you carry enough mac and cheese life works out so um, uh, hold on let's rewind back you said you was on tv a couple times too I was on TV a few times for, for my stand-up. Um, like, here, here's the thing. Here's the, here's the big, the big trick of it all, right? Is like I always did everything when I was way too young to do it. So that got me a lot of attention from like local papers and things like mm -hmm. that. Like, child writes book, child makes thing, fifteen year old professional stand-up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I was kind of a novelty, and I don't think I was very funny, to be honest. And then on top of that, I'm also legally blind, so the fact that I draw pictures always gets a lot of attention. Um, and then, uh, once, so once I started, like, once I had, like, a little bit of a name, I started doing these conventions, I had the, the books were, like, a, a net zero for me because, like, the advertising covered the cost of printing them, mm -hmm. and they looked nice. And I'm a really good salesman, it turns out. And I was able to, you know, start, like, I think at first when I was, I was coming to the end of high school and I, like I I'd, I'd do four or five shows a year and I could usually bring in like a couple of thousand dollars per show. Mm -hmm. And that made it really worthwhile for me to not get a part-time job in college. Yeah. Oh, and, that's awesome. That is awesome. And then like when i finished college i was like i've put out um i'd done one ongoing series i'd done 
a bunch of graphic novels and then I'd done one really nice big like 200 page book and I was like that's it that's the end I'm done <laughs> and I will go off and become a high school teacher and then I lost my mind a little bit because I didn't want to be a high school teacher um I was really convinced that adults had to be miserable because I'd never met a happy adult and so I thought I would just kind of slump into the life that I'd seen other people around me have but I thought I need to do one last thing before I dip out of this. So I wrote a feature script about comic books. And then I poured all the money that I'd saved into making this film. And some stuff went wrong, which I won't go into. But basically, after spending, you know, enough money to buy a house, um, the footage was unusable. Oh, no. And so I was pretty bummed out. And I, like, what, what I was doing at this point is I was working as a substitute teacher three days a week and editing the film four days a week. And then this someone found one of my books on a film set and contacted me. Um, and I realized that it was the same person that I'd been chatting to on, uh, on silverdaddies.com. And the combination of like, hey, we really want to fuck in real life with, I've seen your books and they're very good, meant that I ended up moving to Australia um, and working on this film as his assistant and also meeting a lot of people at Fox. Um, and basically like the, this realization that like the world isn't New Zealand, the world is bigger than that and that there are actually like being in a situation where you're surrounded by other people who are working in a creative field is, is intoxicating. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd never really felt that before. And so I, it all fell apart because, you know, as I mentioned, he was secretly married, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I moved back to New Zealand and was just like, I'm going to do whatever I can to like have that, find that life again. Taste, get that taste again. I get that. Yeah. 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 And so I just, I started doing, um, basically Blastosaurus got optioned um by this company that were like there was a lot of promises and a lot of good people attached and they all fell apart and everything went away but i was still with them mm -hmm. and then the book got released and horribly misprinted and got recalled and i ended up in a hotel room with a wrestler who was recovering from a meth problem and i lost some starro action figures and a whole long story and comic-con was miserable and a santa claus stalked me for a little bit and then <laughs> I came back to New Zealand again and was like, okay, I'm going to just do Blastosaurus properly on my own here. And I relaunched mm -hmm. it in New Zealand and like, I went big, you know, I was straight into like big, nice hardcovers. We would put out one volume of the main story a year, plus we would put out a spinoff called No Added Color, which were just noir Blastosaurus stories. I wrote a daily web comic. Um, I started making like other spinoff and side projects uh, and like, it, it, it just worked. It just consistently worked. And the, the I'd lost a little bit of steam because of taking some time off from the conventions. But mm -hmm. once I started doing them again, the old audience came back. And like, by the way, it, during all this time, I had zero web presence. I had zero anything with any like actual real publishers. Um, it was just like, I was making my living five weekends a year. Um, and that's cool except that there's like a, a big ceiling on that one because you know you get to a certain age and all the people who were like unsuccessful and struggling or wanted to be writers 10 years ago now have followed all the right paths and have agents and publishing deals and the ability to go way beyond the money that that i was making or the fame that i was going to get in new zealand and so i got really depressed um and uh you know long story longer I, I i did try and kill myself by stealing a boat um but failed because i'm bad at untying knots and then i got in a fight with a homeless man who tried to beat me up when i was getting out of the boat and then um i was like fuck it i'm going to america <laughs> you know one of those like good normal stories um yeah yeah i'm just here like along the way i'm like man i should have got some popcorn pop before this one <laughs> I was, I was, yeah, pop, popcorn is one of those really good podcast foods. You know, uh, so, you. so, um, what was it? I was, uh, I seen this thing on TikTok where they take the popcorn bag and they turn it upside down. And instead of like opening it all the way, like the steam hole, you shake it and you shake all the unpopped like, kernels out of it. Um, so that way you don't accidentally eat one. 
and it worked i was like what the actual fuck like this actually this worked 110 percent like I, I i'll never do it differently so here's the key to uh to popcorn don't don't fuck around with microwave popcorn it's it's always shit um put oil in a pan mm -hmm. in, you know in a pot um about you know a quarter of an inch of oil on the bottom put in the three kernels turn on the turn on your burner put the lid on and you just wait when you hear all three of them pop dump in the rest mm -hmm. because then all of the oil is evenly heated and so every kernel will pop that's that's pretty smart i've never thought of that that is awesome and, and then you, you just wait make until it. you can wait until you can count to three between hearing a popping sound and that's mm -hmm. when everything's done making uh perfect popcorn 101 with richard let's go let's go and then himalayan rock salt is also obviously pretty important i for year when i first moved to la um we were like broke like like a bad joke and mm -hmm. we would just eat popcorn and we had a code for free delivery from that like first there was some glitch in uber eats and we got free delivery forever for like one year and it was at the point where you could get 50 nuggets for eight dollars and so the three guys that I was living with and I would order 200 McNuggets a day and just live on McNuggets and popcorn. Hey, uh, I've, I've, I lived on uh, ramen noodle and 40 ounces for a big chunk of my life when I was trying to save up money. So I can't, you know, I've had a pretty horrible diet before too. I got the older rattlesnake tattooed on my side even. I gotta pay tribute. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys, you guys have King, uh, King Cobras over uh, where you're from? Uh, no, no, we don't, but I'm familiar with it, so yeah yeah <laughs> they taste like shit but oh my god we got j michael miller over on youtube saying keeping it pop corny hey and then we have oblivio over on twitch saying hi as well so richard you get to you get to la uh you're living off uh 200 chicken nuggets and popcorns a day mm -hmm. where are you at with the with comic writing and in the comic scene at that point so by that point i'm like i am i'm divorced i've broken up with my long-term boyfriend i have lived in a hotel with this philanthropist surfer who i think turned out to be a pedophile but i really dipped out of that scene before i found out so that was <laughs> good good save there um and then met this like i met a man at a bird sanctuary who was in new zealand judging a dog show he lived in canada so i moved and i was moving to la and then we kind of jumped back and forth to be together for forever after that um and I had shot down all my publishing in New Zealand because I was like, I just have to, I have to, it has to be a clean break. Mm -hmm. um, I was at a convention and I like, I was going, I was going back to the US for, I was making some good decisions. I was flying to America because I wanted to go to a Tegan and Sarah concert. Now, I always want to go to a Tegan and Sarah concert, but I've been to a bunch. Like, I didn't need to fly to America for another one, mm -hmm. but... I was at a convention, it was, it was four days until I was going to leave for this vacation. I mean, it was a work trip, but you know, I don't believe in vacations. Um, and I looked around and like my booth was 60 feet wide and 20 feet deep and I had 200 goddamn titles for sale and two <laughs> mobile phone apps based on my characters and one, like, I call it an inaction figure because it has zero points of articulation of Blastosaurus. And, like, <laughs> there was nothing else I could do. I was 30 years old, and I, like, I'd, I'd hit that, that same wall that I hit when I was 20 when I thought there's nothing else to do. I have to end this. So I, um, I took everything I owned to the convention with me the next day. And it was, every, every book was now $1, and every book came with a free personal item. And I walked out of there with 30000 in cash, and wow! Just like a big tub of what I still owned, which was my plastic skeleton, Nigel, six pairs of shoes, and like some underpants and some shirts. Mm -hmm. And I went to the airport and said, "America, please!" And I flew to LA, um, and then stayed. And I don't know. It just like I, my my plan was take a year and figure out what I was going to do next, and not do any comics, and or like not do any, not not try and find a publishing deal or anything like that make some stuff if i feel like it mm -hmm. um and then on my first day i got offered a a, a, a publishing deal for blastosaurus and then that was just full time for that first year um and then i was getting married and i was building a haunted house for my wedding and uh i was like shit i'm, I'm stuck again i gotta do something different and i'm going to 
New York for my honeymoon, so I might as well see if I can get some meetings with publishers uh, and do something different. And then I got uh, an email from an old editor saying, hey, top secret, but come in for a meeting. Um, I can't tell you what the company is, but think of a series. And so I went in and I didn't have a series. I had a bunch of one-off things I felt like doing. And mm -hmm. I lied and said, oh yeah, I've got a thing I've been working on for a while. Um, it's based on my childhood when I spent a lot of my summers at a haunted lighthouse. And they were like, yep, we'll take that. And so now I have Black Sand Beach and like I'm starting the art on volume four of that tomorrow. So I'm every, every story in my life is, and then I ended up trapped in a new thing again. It's like COVID was, bad for you know everyone and a mm -hmm. lot worse for people for a lot of people than it was for me certainly um but um the the part that's been hardest for me about it is that everything every time it feels like something good is going to happen it kind of gets yanked away again so like right at the beginning of it all black sand beach one was going to come out in april of 2020 and i had a big tour for that and there was a huge publicity push for it. And there was going to be a lot of stuff, you know. And then suddenly we go into this world where I can't, the bookstores are closed and I can't mm -hmm. go on tour. And frankly, people are like buying comics in record numbers, but everyone's buying things they're familiar with. No one is trying new books. And I totally understand that because like, you know what I did during COVID? I rewatched One Tree Hill. Like <laughs> you go to what is well known. Yeah, and to your comfort, I get it. Yeah. Um, and, and so like, that kind of felt like it was crashing down and then i uh started various new things you know and then like end of last year things were gonna like so things were opening up and i was vaccinated and everything was good i had 11 vaccines by the way i do i like i collect them um but then omicron hit and so all this new work that was going on there suddenly went away and i can't talk about what that work is because it still might come back and then uh this this year i have uh a bunch of new stuff going on and a bunch of things that i'm meant to be i'm meant to be i'm in canada right now and i'm meant to be back in la pitching and then uh my husband has injured his knee and now i have to be here and look after him and i'm not resentful of that at all of course i will be here doing that but it's like god damn it every time every time i'm close to going and doing something something you know it's it's you know when you're a kid and you think you're gonna get home in time to watch your favorite episode of elf and then your mother's like, oh, we just have to make one more stop. And it's always nine more stops. Mm -hmm. That's what life feels like at the moment. I'm trapped in a car with my mother. And then when you get home, you get to see the last few seconds of the end credits. Yeah, it's just like the, the alien enforcement team are just dragging Elf away but, in the back of the car. And he's crying. The family the, are watching. Sadly. I mean, the thing is, like, when you hit that, though, you're going to be so prepared for it because you built up there, you know? Like, um, I, I could say uh, in my experiences, I've done six years as a content creator on Twitch. Um, in that time, I almost hit partner twice, and it was one of those things where, um, you know, I was having like 7,200 people watch me play video games, and it was just this surreal feeling. It was just indescribable, and I had no idea. That's how I met uh, Oblivia, uh, who uh, we've been together for three years. She was in California at the time. I was in Ohio. She was my mod, and we always talk shit about playing Bloodborne together, and uh, basically, one thing led to another. She ended up moving over here, and... Uh, yeah, my thing with Twitch though, uh, to, to cut to the chase, um, it like died down. Like I was like right there, I had it, but I wasn't able to maintain it. And like now with like keeping it geekly, I'm like on that surge like up again. And it's like, I feel like I'm so much better prepared to take it on this time around because I had that experience previously. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm sorry, my mind is blown that Twitch has been around for six years. Oh, Twitch has been around for like 10. It used to be Jacob TV uh, way back in the day. Wow. God, I'm out of touch. Like, I, I, I still make jokes about subscribing to people's Periscope. <laughs> oh, man. There, there's been so much that it, it's crazy to think about, like, where we landed in this time era. I mean, like, just in terms of, like, like technology, like, I remember dial-up computers. I remember if you were on the phone, you couldn't use the Internet. Well, I'm, okay, like, at the beginning of this call, like, I, I, again, I feel like I'm a teenager again because I'm theorizing about movies but also because Twitter spaces are like old Java chat where we are just like up late at night talking about mm -hmm. comic books with other cool kids. And then at the beginning of this call, when you were having some technical difficulties, you asked, you asked your partner if they were on the internet. You're like, Hey, are you on the internet? Right? Like, yeah. Cause we, we live in an age where apparently we still have to do that. It's so it's, it's weird.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the technical difficulties, I think, will always be there. It's just, I, I guess, as we advance, like, we, we, like, tend to, like, not notice it nearly as much. <clears throat> but yeah you know and it's crazy too the more we have this um this talk and i get to learn more about you i see so much of you in haunted hill it's like it's insane like to kind of see like all the little tidbits in there isn't it amazing like how good i am at, at, at never directing the conversation back to the comic we're meant to be talking about <laughs> Hey, I'm, but the thing is, I'm good at it, so no worries, no worries. Um, but I truly, I truly do mean that though, because I see so much of your story like in this. Like, uh, we we see the main protagonist. She's from New York, right? And then uh, Keith, I get, I, I get a lot of Keith. I get a lot of Keith because uh, Keith. Look, look, you, you caught it too. I get a lot of Keith from you. He's the worst. Oh, he wanted to be there to occupy. He wanted to be there for occupy, though. He was talking about yes, how he missed, yes. it. and that—that's that, exactly what I mean. Like how he, how he was reminiscent of it, how he wished he was there. Like I was like, I wonder if this is something deeper to this. And then you were, you know, you're talking about it earlier. I'm like, okay, like that clicked. Keith, Keith is the character who, like, I, I was, I wanted to create a character who you have one great night with, and then he's in your friend group and you start to realize what a piece of shit he is. Oh my god, so you're like, I can't believe this dude just compared me to Keith. <laughs> there is, like, like, he's... So you're two issues in, right? So you've... So Sasha has, has taken a dump in the back of Keith's car, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, which I think is deserved. Um, you know, I don't... I was at the part where uh, they went to the donut shop they ate donuts and then they picked up the who they thought was a homeless man, but he ended up not not being a homeless man. Yeah. Okay, so you're okay. So you, you've read you've read part one, like you've read part one of issue two. Um, oh, I didn't realize they were in parts. Yeah, the first issue is one full issue because I posted it just as okay. That was the launch, and then I do six pages a week, so it's uh, each issue is three chapters. Oh, all right, all right, yeah. So that's um, that's where I'm at at that part then. Okay, so. So you're still at the part where like Keith seems like a pretty nice guy. He's yes, like a little yes. Bit, little bit reserved. Um, man, you're you're in for a journey. <laughs> and like I I really try and play with it so that like he is also he's he's 25, right? So you have to always view it through this lens of like maybe he'll grow out of this. Mm -hmm. Like. That's the, that's the tipping point, right? Like, by the time you're 30, if you're an asshole, you're an asshole. But at 25, maybe you come back from it. Yeah. Um, it, it's, you know, like, when I was when I was 14, I thought Adam Carolla was funny. I grew out of it. I forgot who, I for, even, I forgot that dude. Oh my God, that is such, this is like a, a trip down memory lane. I got reminded of him recently because I, uh, <laughs> I also just rewatched Dawson's Creek. <laughs> <laughs> I've, my, my specific brand of television is things shot in Wilmington. That is it. Yeah, hey, it, it, it works too. It works. I mean, I just got two shows. I don't know if anything else has ever been shot there. I'm sure it has, <laughs> but man. So, real quick, before we start diving into Haunted Hill, there is a question I was uh, curious about since you made a, a mention of it. With you uh, being legally blind, like, how does that go into you creating art? Like, how do you go about doing that creative process well for fine detail work i wear this, i wear this which normally has a lens in it uh, so it's real cool um no i just i usually just sit really close to the page and, and mm -hmm. i i can there's never a point where i can see an entire comic page clearly so i have had to get really good at knowing like i have to remember exactly what the page is going to look like I have to figure out the layout. I have to figure out what the, what the storytelling is from that first hit that people get of looking at it as one complete thing and then how they're going to be guided through it. And I have to hold that all in my head as I draw it. And I so, think I'm pretty good at it mostly. When So when you go to start an issue, what does that look like for you? Like, you know, do you script it first and then like panel it out or thumbnail it out? Like, what's your process? Well, so Haunted Hill is like, is this big rejection of everything that I'm, I'm meant to do, right? Um, it was, I started it during COVID because of like having some time. Um, and I, I did to be like, there are a lot of parts that I hate in, in making comics and all of like, none of those parts are the actual making of the comics. They're all in the waiting for other people parts. 
Mm -hmm. And I had sent off a, um, I'd sent off a synopsis of a script uh, to a, a, an editor. And the editor had not gotten back to me for like eight months for a two page synopsis. And then they got back to me and they're like, looks good. And suddenly I had to write a script from the synopsis that I'd done eight months ago, which I no longer cared about. And it just, it's that, that like having to wait for things. And so I had this, I knew I was going to have these two days off uh, back in January. Mm -hmm. And I thought, fuck it, I'm going to make a comic in that time. And there will be no waiting, there will be no planning, and I will also remove any digital alterations. I fucking hate computers. Um, I was gonna say, you did this, it looked like you did this whole entire thing the traditional way and just and uploaded it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I actually, I scanned, it, everything is photographed, not scanned, which is why it looks, it looks like the original art. It's, it's wonderful. Um, so I, uh, I woke up one morning, I went out to my, my writing office and I wrote a six page script and then I came inside and I drew it. And then two days later I had the first six pages of Haunted Hill and that was it. And then I was like, that, that it'll be a standalone piece. I might throw it into an anthology for someone at some point. Mm -hmm. And then the notes I was waiting on for this other thing didn't come through. And so I was like, okay, I guess I've got the weekend. I might as well make it an 18 page thing. Cause I think 18 pages is a really good length for an issue a lot of the time. I don't know why, it's just the format I work in well. And um, I, I made the first issue, and then I was like, this is the most fun I've had in a long time. I'm just <laughs> going to keep doing it. And the notes kept not coming through, and then suddenly I had 12 issues. Um, so it's like nothing is, there's no storylines that are planned. Like, I just mm -hmm. kind of stumble through things. Um, Eva is a big sloppy mess of a person. You know, she's, she, Eva is a hot dog. That's like, that's how I, I describe her to people. Like, she is appealing for a while but you always overestimate how much of her you can handle um you always have too much and then you end up regretting it and she is inexplicably everywhere in hollywood even though she clearly doesn't belong so what about sasha though sasha is sasha is this uh she's the she's a she's a real she's a real person she is the she is the She's the younger mess, you know, like, like every, everyone, everyone is a mess, no matter what part of your life you're mm -hmm. in, you could be fucking nailing it at everything you're doing. And then you hit one speed bump and you're a disaster yeah. or something that you couldn't have predicted. So everything that Eva doesn't do well, Sasha can handle. Sasha can light a cigarette because she just has a good lighter that she knows where it is. Sasha can walk around in shoes that are very uncomfortable. Whereas Eva, Eva wouldn't reject the idea of wearing those shoes. She would just do wear them and fall over. You know, Eva is, Eva is me wearing this jacket. I look like a fucking roll of foil, but you know, I'm, you I'm look still dashing. Excited you look like a jacket. dashing roll of foil. <laughs> just, hey Richard, did you did you did you choose something that really shone a lot of like reflective light up on your big chin disaster? Is that what you did? <laughs> Are you, are you, oh, it pushes up as well. So it's like a real bullfrog look and it makes you bulk here on a camera from a low angle. Look how well you've done today. Hey, let's go. We're killing it though. We're having an awesome time. I love this interview. This has been, this has honestly been such a good conversation. So but, let's go ahead. Yeah, so, so, like, so Sasha is, is like, she's, she's the pieces that Eva can't do. And so they have this like really, it's a, it's a very true friendship that they're forming, but it's incredibly transactional. Um, if you like, I don't know if it's come up yet in the stuff you've read, but like, Sasha gives Eva a cigarette, uh, gives her, her a light in exchange for a cigarette. Mm -hmm. That is like, that is their first moment of transaction. Eva has Sasha's back for the rest of this adventure. And it's because of that, because of that moment, every like, and she never offers that kindness to anyone else. Eva is someone who genuinely believes she's a very good person. But when push comes to shove, she pretty instinctively does selfish shitty things like we all do yeah yeah it's human nature um man i we got a, enough of this description let's actually pull the book up we have the opportunity to look at the first issue and break it down with richard i'm excited for this have you ever done this before no cool so this will be a fun time let's go ahead i'm not um, sure i've ever read this <laughs> <laughs> I, I always love doing this uh, because it's interesting to kind of get your perspective on it and then what I originally was thinking when I was reading it because often, you know, the case, you know, being is uh, two different uh, type of, you know, scenarios. So right here is the cover of Haunted Hill. 
and we see now this three is fingers. digitally colored obviously this is this is very very digitally colored but was it something uh, you colored yeah okay i, so I did I, everything for everything and you were telling me that this was kind of a representation of like every scene yeah i like i want I want, with the covers for this series, I wanted everything to be really like visually appealing, but also a little bit off-putting. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's shiny and it's nice, but it's still someone who's like about to finger blast a donut. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, you like th throughout the issue, you've got um, the discussion of, of of Slam Town, which we'll get to, but mm -hmm. then you've also got the donut shop, and you've also got the discomfort of it. And again, Eva being this big appealing sloppy mess like you want to eat that donut but you also know you'll regret it all right so let's go ahead and start scrolling and i love the richard sucks right there part um what, what, what size the way, is this the, like your, your the, trademark yeah yeah the name uh the name haunted hill is uh because i i saw the movie house on haunted hill when i was really young mm -hmm. and it bugs the shit out of me that that movie is actually about a uh haunted house on a regular hill um and so i've been like for years i've been thinking about well what makes a hill haunted and that does come into the story later but okay. uh, i promise all the ghosts are underground so they never so take the story i'm wondering though i mean if a house is haunted and it's on the hill wouldn't that theoretically make the hill itself haunted i mean okay but if your house is red does that make the grass outside it red if the paint was on it like is the house the entire hill it could be. I mean, I don't know how there the basement. The basement goes into the hill, hill, right? The basement There's goes in one there. Haunted house. <laughs> how big's this hill? We talking? I mean, let's let's. <laughs> all right i'm not, all right all right let's get into issue issue one page one. Uh, so we see right here is three six two two. Any significance of this number? Um, just very similar to the actual place it's based on. I got gotcha. you. So yeah. uh, a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a familiar number there, and then spit. Was there any inspiration for this shirt? Um, it was actually a, a person who I was really close with during during COVID. Uh, had a who I'm no longer friends with, unfortunately. Um, but we talk on Zoom all the time, and they wore a shirt that actually said "Spit spreads death." But of course, because of the way Zoom cuts you off, I only ever saw the word "spit," and I was like, "God damn it, that's good!" Like, <laughs> like, yeah. I, I really like shirts that have one big bold word for no reason uh, throughout mm -hmm. the series. Even doesn't change her underwear at any point in this uh, series. Uh, and we're three days into the adventure at the point where I'm at now. Um, but she does change her shirt every storyline. So it's spit this time. And then I think it's butts next time. And then I think it's honk for the third one. So what was uh, your, your reasoning behind uh, the next two? Um, like any sort of like Easter egg behind them or anything? Um, I, some people started, uh, commenting on, on, uh, the way someone's, okay. <laughs> some people started complimenting me on the way that I draw Eva and her movements because she is, um, like I, I, I make her beautiful without sexualizing her. Yeah. Um, and I also make the grossness of her kind of like the sloppiness is beautiful. And one of the comments I got was like, you draw boobs moving realistically. Um, and I, and they said, how, how, as a gay man, do you pay so much attention to boobs? <clears throat> and I said, oh, I'm more interested in looking at butts. And so then I thought, that's a good joke. I should write the word <laughs> butts across her boobs next time. Because mm -hmm. I also think it's like, it's really funny, like the weird confrontational nature of like, if you're, st if you're, if you're staring at someone's chest, you, you know, you're a creep. Um, but if you're staring at someone's chest and it's just mislabeled, I think that's really funny. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look at my butts. <laughs> <laughs> so what about a uh, honk? Um, I, I actually might not be right about honk. I can't. I, I think it says honk. I think it was it was purely like I need a word that's short enough that I won't get annoyed having to draw it, and I know mm -hmm. that S's are horrible to color in around. Um, and so I just was kind of just playing around with short words that are fun to say. I got gotcha. you. So I really love this little nod to the the Uber driver right here as well. Was this the type of car that uh, they always delivered in? Uh, yes. <laughs> that is so awesome. I love like like I said when I read this, and then you were telling me uh, your your story. I, I was like, man, there's too many 
similarities like in this this has to have some dots connecting right here so this is where our main character meets sasha and uh we have the infamous uh, infamous meeting where uh she can't find her lighter and uh she asks to get her lighter now um this is a pretty i i, I the one of my favorite things that i love about this was the sense of realism you add to it and that you're able to achieve anytime i've ever asked anyone for a lighter it's always like well can i get a cigarette to bum that's always like the case so i loved how you were just able to nail that in like interaction just like perfectly it's also that like when you they, they like they're contributing it, the, 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 the the transaction is so unequal a cigarette costs money mm -hmm. using your lighter costs almost nothing right mm -hmm. you as the person with the cigarettes you have you have the wealth to have afforded cigarettes and this and this person who all they have is a lighter which frankly we all have a bunch of somewhere we just accumulate them by accident yeah people leave them at our houses like it's this deconstruction of wealth of the hierarchy of wealth and i really enjoy little moments like finding the moments in life where that happens like you can be you know the richest boy in rich town and if you don't have a lighter you're powerless right now yeah um so, also the, the 3622 um it's not the same number as the place that it's based on but for it, it's it's kind of a it's a big sign to people who know the place that it is okay like it's a it's a it's a call out like hey and I won't say what the place is until we get into it, but um, like for people, for people who know it, they'll be like, "Oh, I know what kind of book I'm about to get." Okay, all right. Yeah. So let's so let's scroll it's, down. It's a secret code. It's it's the equivalent. It's the comic book equivalent of the hanky code. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you're talking like uh, oh, I'm trying to think of uh, like the pineapple. People used to put pineapples on their mailboxes to let people know uh, they would get they'd be into swinging. I did not know that. Yeah, that's a thing. I'm pretty sure that's a thing. And if it's not, it just became one. Um, <laughs> well, it's like, you know, the, like when you're a teenager, like shoes over the, the phone lines mean you can buy weed here. I didn't know that either. I, but I think when I was buying weed, that's like right when they like had the flip phones. Um, that just became a thing. And then T9 word was a new thing. So instead of typing out the word um, with each individual letter, you could hit T9. And that was like such a revolutionary thing for phones. When I when when the when the T9 dictionary was very popular, um, man, that was phones were so book back then. We're really aging ourselves with this talk right now. <laughs> um, I was I was doing a lot of sewing at the time uh, with, uh, with some friends of mine, but it would always come through as sexing, and so we'd text each other like, "Can I borrow your sexing machine? Hey, you want to come over and do some sexing today?" Um, but I wrote a I wrote a comic a, a, a parody of Terminator. Mm -hmm. um where it was it was uh or a parody of t2 but it was called t9 and the whole goof of it was that like his programming was messed up because of the autocorrect um, oh that's awesome and, that's funny <laughs> and so he didn't like it was when he was he was melting and there was a function where he mm -hmm. had to cool but he kept just reading instead because cool would always become book that's so man that that we could we could dive into that that that's like a whole Audience podcast of zero, though. like Th no that one is so funny that, that is hilarious no like I, I there's so many questions popping up now like how did you come up with that like like to, like did you get a phone and like type in words to see what type of word it would spit out if you typed it incorrectly no it's just like it was just the common ones like okay cool always became book you know and like because you always respond when people are like do you want to do this book so anytime he said fuck it he'd always say doug <laughs> yeah 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 and so oh, like gotcha. like the story had to hinge on the cool book thing but the um also i like the idea that if you described like if someone was like, hey, Richard, cool book. They'd be like, hey, Richard, book, book. Like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so right here we see um, our main character telling Sasha that she's in the middle of quitting. Um, I get the feeling that she really likes to tell more than she needs to. She kind of like over, you know, over explains. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I really like Nita that. Nita has never, never found a sentence that she didn't enjoy saying. Yeah, I really liked how um, we were talking about this earlier. You were able to really flesh out these characters and kind of give them their own sense of like individuality. It was really it was really awesome to see because like right here, she's like, you know, she, she could just say she needs a lighter, but she's like, oh, I really don't smoke. I'm in the middle of quitting, but I just had an interview. So I was, um, you know, and I want to ask, how were you uh, able to like nail um the point of view from a woman you know did you have someone that like you you had them double check to make sure this seemed like it was okay or like you know what was your process with that 
Um, no, I, I mean, like, as I said, there's, there's no double checking on this. Like, it's literally written and drawn immediately. Um, nothing's ever been, I've, like, I literally haven't read this issue since I drew it. Um, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. I like, this is, this is a don't look back, uh, <laughs> approach to comic making. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, there's, you know, like, there are some things like, a there's an issue that came out or a chapter that came out a couple of weeks ago where it's, um, this guy, like it's it's at a, a memorial service for this guy who's died, and his uh, his ex-wife has remarried to another guy in the crime family. Um, now, so we're talking, we've got just some very old people, okay, old mob types at a memorial service, and this horrible old guy is explaining to the son of the man who just died who was uh is like this 30 35 year old asian guy and this old white guy is explaining to him how back in his day they loved having a chinese in their mob because people were intimidated by them because they just thought they knew that kung fu mm -hmm. and it's like it's like i think like i nailed the exact kind of racism that old people have and think is completely fine to say but like and, and like and then the, the end result is like this the 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 son of the, the the grandson of the kid who of the of the guy who's died uh gets sent off to get uh this old racist guy a drink and does like absolutely cut it with toilet water um <laughs> and so you, you get this like nice payoff yeah. of like shitty things happen to these people and i, I like but I, I think that, you know, when people talk about taking TV shows out of context and showing moments from things, comics are the easiest thing to do that with. Because, like, if you took a panel of, like, a guy saying that um, and be like, look what Richard thinks. I'm like, no, my character thinks that. Like, and he's a shitty character who I draw, like, a big, ugly, gross monster thing. Like, he's a bad person, and I think I've, like, portrayed that well. But, mm -hmm. like, it's also still, you know, you, you, you run some risks, right? Um... But I think, like, if I gave myself the opportunity to go back in and edit, I might, like, and I, I think it's a really good scene, by the way. Like, a bad thing happens to a racist guy. That's that's the the driving force of that scene, and that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, like, I also know that if I had stopped and thought about it for long enough, I might have gone, like, oh, but what if people just read that one panel? Or what if people stop on that page? Or like, whatever, whatever, whatever. And they're not going to. You know, like, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's another scene, like, there's a Eva's a problematic character. She's going to masturbate to something that she frankly shouldn't be watching. Um, not in any kind of illegal. Well, no, not in any kind of way that's like really, really bad, but just like makes her a bad person. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I'm like, at what point, like, where like it's always about finding that balance. So like, when Eva's being shitty, she has to also be doing something really right. Or if someone is a despicable character, you have to show that there is comeuppance for them, whatever. But yeah. this is like, th sorry, that's all of the never look back part of it. But you were asking about how do I write women? Well, um, women are people, so that's sort of quite easy um, to do. You 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 try you write people and you make like like there's not an inherent difference to to to, to genders that like defines that I couldn't write them um, or that anyone couldn't write them. I think people get weird and in their heads about that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that like like people are treated differently and we have like different outcomes from it. I think that one of the interesting things about especially Hollywood and you know this is this this book is a love letter to Hollywood and I hate using mm -hmm. language like that but it is. <laughs> um, because I was, I, I wrote it because I was missing Hollywood so much while I was in, while I was stuck in Canada. Um, so misogyny is one of the biggest problems in the world, and it's kind of the root cause of most bad things. Like, like mm -hmm. just there's so much that comes back to misogyny, um, and homophobia comes back to misogyny. And there's this point that I'm realizing is, as a, like, like, I am a, 
I'm an overweight gay man who's not particularly interested in uh, having sex with anyone under the age of 55. Like, by Hollywood standards, I'm completely irrelevant. And the way that young women are treated in Hollywood is they're objectified and it's horrible. And as they, the, the misogyny seems to change, or what I've observed at least, is that the misogyny towards women changes as they become older, or if they become, like, if, if they're being outspoken, where they get shunted aside as if they are also irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And so I think, like, there's, like, when I'm, when I'm writing, a, you know, this is not a scene about misogyny, but there are, there are many scenes where Eva is, is calling out Keith and, uh, and Drew, on shit they're doing um it's it's stuff that like frankly i've observed like i i i don't i don't think it's a coincidence that 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 as a gay man most of my close friends are women it's because like we have not experienced the same things but we have there's a there's a there's a thematic link you know Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's pretty easy to get like to tap into that mindset. Also, it's you know it's, it's easy to be a good writer if you're good at writing. Yeah, cause... yeah, you've had years and years of experience writing too, so I'm sure that had to definitely help uh, kind of steer you in this direction. So real quick, and just kind of trying to pivot back to this, we see the, uh, that interaction that you were talking about earlier, where uh, she's you know over explaining things, uh, and she's looking through her purse to find a lighter, but she can't find one. And then Sasha, of course, is like, I have one if you have a cigarette. And then I love this little bit right here. You said you were quitting, so I'm just helping you. So I thought that was the kind of a little funny panel as well um, to kind of get that extra cigarette um, from her. So this uh, this interaction, like what drove you to want to start their, uh, like they're, they're friends at this point, right? Um, where you're at in the story, like currently? Yeah, I mean, so, like this, this story is told basically in real time. Like it takes six issues for Eva to get home. <clears throat> so what what inspired you to kind of start it off with a cigarette um because it's it, like i'm drawing this with wishy-washy gray markers smoking looks cool <laughs> 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 and i like the idea that like like quitting is obviously a sign of self-improvement right like mm -hmm. no no one quits smoking because it's not because they hate smoking so much they quit smoking because they want to be better yeah and i think it's really telling that eva wants to be better but is struggling with it so this is where they introduce each other, um, Sasha and Eva. And then this is kind of where we get the big breakdown. You know, what's this place that I've worked to next for the last three months? And then we get a number, uh, another shot of a uh, 3622. Um, it's busy every single night. And then uh, this is where she kind of is a little sus. She's like, well, how old are you? I want to get a good idea before I corrupt a minor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, I get this a lot, too. A lot of people don't believe me when I tell them I'm 32. Um, it's just getting, getting uh, the, the, you know, you were given the gift of writing and creating. I was given the gift of uh, not aging, um, it, it seems like. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, another awesome interaction, too. Sorry, I don't know why, you know, I, I wanted to give you a cigarette and let, you know, if I didn't think you were a minor. That's, I've had that interaction, too, where, you know, you look old enough to smoke, but I don't know if you're old enough for this part of the story yet. So I've, I've definitely, I like how you're able to kind of bring that, that realism into it. And then uh, this is where we get the breakdown of the infamous Slam Town. So Slam Town, 3622 Beverly Boulevard, is um, not the real address, but the real street. It's a prison-themed sex club, basically. Um, a lot of str I found a lot of straight people don't know these sort of places exist. You walk in, you pay your money, and then you walk around kind of a shittily constructed, dirty, stinky maze with hidden rooms everywhere to fuck. <laughs> and sometimes they're like full nudity places. Sometimes you're clothed. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, there's literally an area called the Suckatorium, which is <laughs> like a split level with bars and you walk along on the lower level and dicks come at your face. Um, there are sling rooms. There are dark rooms for orgies. There, mm -hmm. uh, there is a bathtub if you want to piss on someone. Like these places are, they're very unique. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like... Uh... Any any kind of fantasy that you you would wish for might appear there, um, depending on what level it is. But real dirty, 
Like, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's run down and it's broken. And it's like, I actually, I think that a place like this is wonderful, firstly. Like, I mm -hmm. will never say a bad thing about these kinds of places because it is a place for people to, like, everyone, it, it, it's, it's, it's incredibly sex positive and incredibly focused on consent and mm -hmm. safety and condoms and lube are given out freely and it's also a place where it's it's a it's a it's a private place for you for people to be anonymous and it, it's like it's kind of wonderful and a lot of the shitty beauty standard stuff that you see at especially in hollywood again but gay bars where it's you know muscle twinks which muscle twink by the way is my current grinder username um but my profile <laughs> picture is me shirtless and i've drawn muscles on with a sharpie um uh i'm, I'm not getting a lot of attention it's weird um but like <laughs> like there's, there's there's a real beauty standard and a real like judgmental nature to it and then you take somewhere like slam town and it's like look be be, be whatever kind of gross you want to be Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to be that kind of gross, don't come here. That's also fine too. It's there's there's something very it, it feels important that something like that exists. Yeah, it seems like it's liberating, uh, but it has that charm as well. I mean, <laughs> it definitely, uh, it, it, and it definitely the way uh, uh, some of these scenes were drawn too. Um, I love this. This is uh, uh, what's he doing right here? Um, I, oh. I forgot. What's so the, this is the guy. He's sniffing poppers. Poppers, yes, poppers. Yeah. It, and that, that line just... of that line of holes in the wall—that's the suckatorium. So yes. you kneel in front of those, and, and that could come through. Um, <laughs> and then we have some of the scenes uh, from the sex maze. Uh, fucking a stranger yeah. here. Uh, Arna Harness here. Um, yeah, the, the, the guy, I, the, the the bald head on the right, the guy rimming the guy in the sling. That's uh, that, that is my husband. <laughs> uh, he's so proud to be drawn to it. And it's interesting because he's got a spe such a specific hair pattern that everyone who reads it who knows him is like, oh, that's Ray. Oh, that's awesome. That's funny. And then I love how... He does not um, love it. The, he does not love it. I love how the smoke is kind of like trailing up to it. Like it's almost like in the... Yeah, it is. Because like right here, like you see the smoke kind of like behind it too. So I really love how the paneling was in this. Like it was at the vision, then it kind of got split by the three in the middle. And then you see it finish off in this panel right here. So this is kind of where we get the breakdown that uh, she is doing daytime maintenance and uh, being a janitor there, but uh, the place is strictly dicks only during business hours. I thought that was pretty humorous too. Yeah, and like, here's here's the thing about it, like, uh, that like I'm I am seeding something there. I'm seeding a, an idea for later because Eva is the. I don't want to give away anything from the No, you're fine, future. you're fine. You're, you're fine. But uh, in, in what I'm thinking of is season two of the story, um, season two is her first uh, two days on the job. Um, and it will be about, like, whether this place is welcoming to, like, whether this place is about cis men, cis mm -hmm. gay men, or if it's, like, welcoming to others as well. And, uh, like... I don't have a I don't have an answer for whether or not the company is doing a good thing with that, but I do have like people giving, like trying to break it down, and I'm interested in that kind of breakdown. So yeah, when she you. says it's only, she's going to be wrong, but like, yeah, just just seeding some ideas for later. I, I really like uh, the foreshadowing too. Foreshadowing can be kind of hard sometimes, but it seems like you're really nailing it because there's a couple things, but just like with her personality and her interactions. I mean, it definitely seems like you've planted a couple seeds. Uh, so right here we see uh, Sasha saying that's the grossest job ever. And then she just kind of, you know, meh, 10 years of performative heterosexuality. You know, I'm numb to all of these, you know, this ejaculation. Um, now, the big thing, though, is we see the driver canceled and her phone's at 2%. Now, this puts her in an interesting situation. It also reveals a lot about her, right? Like, she's... She's she's gone to this interview at eight o'clock at night, and her phone is almost dead when she when she goes there. Mm -hmm. Or you know that 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 doesn't belie a responsible person. And also a driver canceling on you, like it, it opens this mystery of, well, why? What like what? How low is your rating on Uber that a driver is canceling on you? Um, and that's just the first time we see that she's going to have a lot of apps cancel on her over the course of the book. <laughs> and then this is when we get uh, to meet uh, Keith. 
Now we we see that they're they have to go to Victor's. Uh, well, Victor's on at nine, and that's that's her friend doing stand up. And Keith uh, is a rather interesting individual. I know you said the first couple of issues, we really don't get to see too much of his uh, his uh, quote unquote charm come out. But even in these, you know, this beginning part, you can kind of see uh, the beginning of his character develop. Yeah, I, I wanted to like capture that like he and Sasha are friends. Like it's it's important that they are friends, and it is not. There's no. There, there's no. Uh, will they won't they to it there's no sexual connection that i'm building to this is like Sa sasha is a is a like part of the complexity of her character is that she values the idea that she's one of the boys she's mm -hmm. fought her way to be one you know and in, in, in the the worst way possible that that turn gets thrown around but like she it, she doesn't want to be seen by her male friends the way they see their girlfriends which no, and I, I definitely can respect that. About these male friends. Like, yeah, uh, I, I could definitely respect that. And that was that challenging for you to write at all, like trying to take it in in that approach, or was that something that just came naturally? Um, I had never really had a lot of uh, straight male friends in my life, uh, shockingly. And uh, when I first moved to LA, um, you know, you move to a new place, you just become friends with the people who are nearest to you at the time, and mm -hmm. you, you, you're you're all dopamined up and you think that everything's going to be great forever and ever and fr frankly i became friends with some people who turned out to be really pretty fucking terrible and one of the consistent things was when i would call them on their terrible behavior uh i was very quickly like cast out of that group it was very much like a you, you know I'm not. I'm not saying these words myself. I'm saying the the the, the motto of bros before hoes. Yeah, was yeah. Really fucking true for these these dudes. And so a lot of the stuff that I'm seeing, I'm I'm showing with with Keith and Drew, is stuff that I've like I've witnessed happening, and and I have I've, I've called them out on it. And as a result, you know, it wasn't like it was, it was. There's never been a situation where you can say to someone, "Hey, you're being shitty," where they don't like. The truth is, a lot of people are shitty, especially to to women, because they have a they have a society that supports that, and they have a group of friends around them who support it. And so, when one person says, "Hey, you're being shitty," the result isn't, "Oh, okay, I'll do better." The result is, "You're out of the group," or "You're yeah. you're off the group chat," or "You're whatever." Um, and so, I, you know, I've, I have had a lot of experience with that. I gotcha. Um, and, and with some of the specific things that happen in this story. I, I really love how this interaction is to eat my whole ass, Keith. I thought that was funny. And then uh, Sasha, of course, offering her a ride. And then this is when we get introduced to the rest of the crew as well. Um, Hudson, mm -hmm. I thought, was a really interesting character. Um, also and notice that Eva doesn't ask for a ride. Eva, can, like, Eva just stammers until she is offered mm -hmm. a ride. She never asks for anything directly. She has I, real trouble with that. What you were uh, talking about earlier, uh, describing, uh, you know, some of the ideas that went into this, you know, uh, Hudson's boyfriend, uh, he definitely uh, is not a very good dude. He he calls her Hudson because he doesn't even know her first name. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, there's some real shittiness there. Um, but also, like, even though there's the shittiness, the first time Eva sits down, she says her phone is dead and he mm -hmm. offers her a charger. You know, like finding that that balance where she can realize what a shitty person he is by how he treats someone else. But when you first meet him, he seems charming and lovely. Yeah. And it's funny, too, because you talk about how uh, some of the things you do might be a little bit more old fashioned compared to others. Like right here, like, oh, this phone's so old, it has a micro USB. Like, uh, you know, your charger's not going to be compatible with mine. I used to work at a phone store. So it's this interaction. Like I've seen this happen almost on a daily basis where people would want to charge their phone. And then they would need one of those crazy little adapters from like, you know, the early 2000s to get it charged up. Well, the phone she's using is a OnePlus 6, um, which is the phone I had at the time. And it was apparently completely 4G capable, but was the only, it was like the most, it was the latest model of phone that got like phased out when uh, AT&T got rid of the 3G network last mm -hmm. year, which is very annoying because it was a really good phone and I had this shitty Pixel. <laughs> and then uh i really like to um because for the most part we kind of had really like gray 
dark blue coloring and then right here when she's describing how she got this phone because it was so old um mm -hmm. we see the, a little bit of coloring so what was going on with this uh the splash of pink going on in here um i just i wanted like whenever she, you know you see the blue when she's talking about slam town and then mm -hmm. the pink when she's telling the story I, I'm, I'm wanting to bring in like this idea that when it's a story it's in color <laughs> i got gotcha. you when it when it's when it's not real it's in color okay uh and so it, it means that i get to bring in this kind of lurid surreal thing because let's face it this book is mostly about people sitting down and talking and that's really boring to draw and to look at so if i can have the fantasy sequences be um as like not just a pop of color but i want to go lurid with this color mm -hmm. whenever i can and then it was pretty although, humorous although I'm, too. I'm like looking at it now i'm really regretting the kind of bluish gray on that couch ugh, it's <laughs> That's an absolute dump. And then uh, just uh, what was needed to, to, you know, it had to be a programmer to use, it and everyone was pretty much telling her. Uh, and given, yeah, the given, OnePlus 6. That's exactly yeah. what happened. Oh, oh like, how, if I can, how do I access this camera mode? Ooh, why are you using this phone if you don't know how to use it? Oh, that would be so annoying. That'd be so annoying. And then, um, yeah, you dropped the phone and broke the, the charging port, I'm assuming, too? Yep. All that is so dog, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is where we kind of see Drew... Um, and the interaction here uh she thinks uh, uh hudson's a, uh, based off of a gargoyle is that from the cartoon uh the gargoyles yeah. animated series yeah i really wanted awesome. to that, that was my first kind of big swing at like establishing that eva is much older than them and they're gonna fucking stare at her like a an alien from a different planet <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it was awesome. Uh, I, I love this little description here and this visualization. And then she's like, no, I'm Hudson because uh, that, you know, I'm from Hudson and Drew keeps forgetting my first name like that. You know, it, it's it's telling not only of Drew's personality, um, but I, I guess, you know, what what she uh, what to Hudson herself is willing to put up with, um, you know, it's, it's almost mind boggling that she would want to be with Drew. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to say it's totally fictional. Wink. Um, a person who, one of those shitty people I was friends with, uh, was dating a girl named Minnie. Because she was from Minneapolis. Wow. And well, she was, like, he was, I actually, I don't know how old he was. I, I think he was in his 30s. And she was just finishing college mm -hmm. and he was definitely the most exciting person she'd ever met because she'd come from a small town and come to LA and then she'd met a musician and they were dating and he kept saying they were in love he was treating her like absolute shit all of the time and didn't know her fucking name and I understand it like when you know like that person who I had you know I've had shitty boyfriends in my life who I have stayed with for far too long because I was terrified of my life being boring without them. Yeah. Um, you know, if it, I dated an abusive monster because he was really smart uh, and he knew a lot of important people and I'd go to important events with him and things and it was always kind of an adventure, but he was an absolute monster. Um, I dated a guy who, who worked in film and like showed me a world I'd never seen before and even when I found out that, like, he was married and this relationship was going nowhere, I still kept in contact with him in email and chat every day for almost a decade. Because, like, my life without him was boring, I thought. Um, so, like, I think that, that fear is something that everyone yeah. can understand. Um, and I think it's always, you know, it's shitty when stories say to you, like, look, this person's an idiot because they're dating someone bad. What an idiot they are. You don't even feel sorry for them. They should be treated like garbage. And I think a lot of books kind of tee you up for that feeling. And I, I didn't want to do that. So I wanted to try and, like, show, show her as sympathetic while still being, you know, mm -hmm. bad so, in her own ways. So we find out later on. Yeah, yeah. And we definitely do because she has no problem telling her exactly how she feels too i thought that scene was rather interesting so we see them driving and then uh we see them getting hungry and uh we, we see drew telling uh keith he has to stop and i, I love this little scene with uh hudson right here uh i'm um, saying you know victor's gonna want us to stay and talk uh talk improv to his friends like that happens when when you go to see your friend at the show they always want to stick around and always cut the shit like right afterwards for like at least an hour mm-hmm 
So I, yeah, I, yeah, I love this. The, the the coloring, the green splashing down, and her in the for the, the front and center, and in like the darker colors, and everyone else in the blues. And like, I have a lot, a lot of friends who do or have done improv, and I think I think all of them would agree that I've really captured the look of of improv types. <laughs> like the, and I don't I don't mean like a. I don't mean how they look as people. I mean just like the ex the expressions and the the, mm -hmm. the vibe that they're giving off of satisfaction in their great great work. And then right here, uh, we we see a mention of a Kelsey, so a little foreshadowing there. It feels like too. Yeah. So uh, they can dip the second Victor's off stage. Kelsey's not going to be there, and we don't have time to stop. So Keith kind of letting you see a little bit of that personality starting to bleed out there. Um, I, I didn't get a chance to see Kelsey, though, so I'm left wondering kind of what Kelsey's going to, you know, have some sort of impact when I get there. So, and then we find out that they were lied to. Victor's not on until 1030. Um, they were told 9. And, uh, yeah, that was really interesting, too. There's been a couple times where I was told a wrong time so I could get there and make sure I'm there on time. So I, 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 I chuckled a little bit when I stumbled on that one. It's also like, even, you know, I understand why people do that, but I also think it, when you let someone know that you've done that, you're showing them mad disrespect. Yeah. Like you're letting you know, you know that you're micromanaging them like an actual baby. And then right here we see that happening, like, no, I don't, Drew. I, I, I love that little, that little uh, reflection mirror uh, close up right there. Mm. But it's also like, you're seeing how everyone is trying to control the situation because something is bubbling mm -hmm. that you know, is going to come out soon enough. And then we we see donuts. Uh, so this was another little interesting scene. Was this something that was kind of uh, designed off something that happened in real life, like a little restaurant you used to go to? So this is um, this is the Richard Karn themed donut store um, that is based on the Treos Donuts and Coffee uh, on uh, La Brea and Santa Monica. Nope, on uh, Highland in Santa Monica. Um, that is, it's it's an iconic place. Like Danny Trejo owns a lot of donuts and wings and taco places. Um, and I wanted to create a world where the, 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 the this, this doesn't hold up through the story, but at this point my plan was, what if the only difference between our real world and the world I'm drawing is that in the world I'm drawing, Richard Karn is exactly as famous as Danny Trejo. And that was really funny to me. And then I got to come up with a bunch of home improvement goofs uh, for the inside of the donut place, mm -hmm. which are all as funny as home improvement. <laughs> so uh, were you a big home improvement fan uh, growing up? Nope. No, nope. nope. I think that show sucks. Like, I was always I was always intrigued about Wilson. Like, what are you doing hiding behind that fence? Well, Did we ever find out? Why fucking fence? Like, yes. hey, Mr. Feeney had his fence at waist height, like a normal person. This dude is like, oh, hi, let me hide my entire body. What you, like, like, what are you doing back there, Wilson? What are you doing? He's jerking so, it, obviously. I love this, too. This little, uh, my cart's still at, at shelter. Um, I got you just uh, Venmo me or whatever. This is, you know, it's a, a normal enough uh action that i see happen a lot where people are, are cash apping or venmo in each other paypaling but i thought it was really cool that you kind of included that within this too to kind of give that realism to your world it's also that like there's no there's no sense from drew that keith would say no like he, he absolutely is he, he, he can just yeah and like think about compare that to how eva had to ask for a cigarette and it had she to was be, bashful like, She's bashful, it was transactional. You, and I'm trying to establish what is the dynamic between Keith and Drew here is that Keith fucking worships Drew. Like Drew is his cooler friend mm -hmm. and he just wants, I mean, the dude wears like a fake Letterman jacket. Like he wants to be cool and edgy so bad and he just sucks at it. I'm sorry for calling you Keith. <laughs> <laughs> It's just oh, I'm so sorry. I just... <laughs> so uh, here we see them getting uh, coffee and donuts uh, and just, you know, more interaction between these two. Are we going to see these two kind of be like the the two protagonists of the story or is it still going to be just based along um, Eva or Eva? Excuse me. It's, it's all about Eva. Um, uh, the oh, I don't want to give away too much, but Sasha is in the first six issues okay 
um, and it's their friendship the whole way through. But that is it covers, it covers about a two hour period of their lives. Um, the the impact of Sasha and the presence of Sasha will 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 always be there through the story, but like issues seven through twelve cover some shit that goes down the next day with Eva and her childhood friend Kevin mm -hmm. um, and his dad's memorial service, and then that night when she releases some ghosts from a treehouse. Long story, uh, and then like her shitty interaction with a dude at a Seven Eleven, and then her like jerking it at her house and then getting a free <laughs> chair from the internet like the adventure is small yeah no i got you so here we see drew uh just showing more of that personality he doesn't get a donut for hudson even though she asked for one and we see her just say she brushes it off saying it's okay she'll just eat off of his and uh you know that's another thing that i kind of see happen often that's kind of sad you know you should always try to take care of your significant other if they're asking for a donut when you're getting one, that's the 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 simplest thing you could definitely do. Like, uh, so literally, Drew doesn't think about Hudson if he's not looking directly at her. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so there's there's my Al Borland on the window. Um, there's an there's a Danny Trejo on the window of the real. One. I, I I knew I I knew the face looked so familiar. Um, I forgot his name was uh, Richard. I I got I just I think of him as Al. I can't think of him as anything else. That's horrible. I know. If you, I think I, I can't remember any of them. And I can't, I can't get close enough to read it on the screen. But uh, all the donuts that they see are named after things, like named after characters on the show, and they're sort of themed. The icing is themed around those characters. Okay. And there's uh, the coffee is called the Heidi Ho Neighbor Chino. Oh, that um, is awesome! Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I seen the face. I was like, "There's no way." Um, and I didn't even like think to even really look into the name of the donuts. I should have. You put so many Easter eggs into it. It's like this is why I love going over these comics like this because you always learn something that I never would have guessed at all. And this is right here where I kind of thought the inspiration, like from you, maybe putting a little bit of yourself into Keith came from. Because like right here, he was saying when he was a kid, seeing the whole Occupy movement on the news. I just wish I would have been there for that. So. When you were talking about earlier how you know you missed out on things um that's where i kind of drew like that conclusion from yeah i also like i was in new zealand when the occupy movement happened and i just remember being uh at a dresden dolls concert mm -hmm. and a bunch of people in this like out, outdoor smoking area were talking about how they loved doing this whole occupy thing and how much fun they're having and like a they had left to go to a concert two it's not a camp out like you're not talking about how much fun you're having <laughs> like stop it yeah um it, 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 that thing that it was that same feeling of like oh, i bet they're being way more authentic about this in new york because you know i was 24 25 mm -hmm. or something at the time so like like that perspective is always how does this relate directly to me and what am i missing out on yeah yeah rather yeah. than what's the important message behind this movement that's happening right now <laughs> So right here, uh, we see some more interaction happening. Um, this is where we get the infamous uh, fingering of the donuts. It's like, tell them about the job you just applied for. Um, so I thought this was, this was interesting, you know, going to be maintaining and cleaning at Slamtown. Everyone's like, what's Slamtown? Yeah, because strange people don't know about places like that. So hey, it, you, it, it was so funny with the donuts. Like, <laughs> No, I, I, I don't know. I am I am just assuming you're straight. That was just shitty of me. Oh, no, no, I, I'm straight, yes. Okay. Um, had you ever heard of a place like Slamtown before yeah, this yeah. conversation? Yeah. Okay. So I would say I'm straight, but I'm definitely not vanilla. Okay. <laughs> right. Like, but you know, a lot of people are genuinely shocked that that like that there's a place that that you. I mean, I think it's also that thing of like, um, I remember someone saying to me once, "You're so lucky you're gay. You can go have sex anywhere." I'm like. I mean, yeah, with risk of, like, if your standards are particularly baseline and you're willing to risk arrest, sure. <laughs> but, like, I don't know if it's the advantage you think it is. Mm -hmm. and we have uh, the Calvary uh, Collective coming in over on YouTube. Yo, Cody, happy to see that I finally caught one of your live streams. Welcome on. We are actually just finishing up wrapping up. It looks like Haunted Hill issue number one. And then we do need to be wrapping up our interview. We are nearing two hours. Holy crap. It's been two hours already. Wow. Yes. Oh, my God. So we get the we get the infamous cover of uh, Sasha fingering the donut to describe Slamtown. 
and uh you know she's kind of just giving the breakdown here you know this is what i'm doing during the day uh it is just making sure it's sparkly clean for when the customers arrive um and everyone else is kind of just trying to get their heads wrapped around and then you know we see hudson say that's disgusting and then this is kind of when keith gets in there and throws a little jab at her i thought that was kind of that was kind of snide of him yeah he's a snide character and then hudson of course saying just fucking kill yourself keith like oh man i i love her snappy her, like the snappy response you know hudson you de you definitely put a lot of like i could just i could picture hudson as a person saying that response like it was you done that well that was really well crafted Thank and you. um it's just we, we see uh see um eva breaking things down you know it's not really that bad there's guys wiping it uh wiping up the stuff when it splatters on the ground she's just there to make sure it's nice and and, and smells good and, and not super slippery and and doing the ref refills now when keith was like that's fulfilling i thought that was a little humorous as well that little like you know i that one off like little line right there well here's the thing about about eva like <clears throat> Her, it's really important for her to be able to talk about what a good person she is. Mm -hmm. um, so like by doing this, she's like letting you know that she's very, it doesn't matter that she's educated and privileged. She does, it doesn't mean that she's better than you. She's still willing to do this job. Yeah. And she will love talking about that until she actually has to do it. And then, you know, she'll, she immediately like on her first day, she immediately tries to like become their social media manager and tries to like build them up and make them a more famous place which all falls apart because it ruins the anonymity <laughs> that's so awesome she actually i this is one of these things where i'm not sure if i get when we get to do it what i want to do and this will this is another one of these things from having to cede some control of this book because of where it's going with mm -hmm. certain other things what i want to do is have her sp set a uh spread a rumor or a tip to tmz that richard karn has been seen at slamtown oh god that'd be awesome <laughs> but i don't think i'm gonna get to do it so we see um really interesting interaction uh right here hudson saying fuck you drew um things are looking like they're at a boiling point drew wondering if he should even follow her so you could tell he's really not that good with dating he's just mm -hmm. it, you know what, what are you even doing there drew um and uh yeah we see eva she's trying to wonder you know what's going on what what did they miss and and you know you could tell there's a little bit going on behind the scenes that she's not used to mm. and uh it was she, she wants to know though that like that's the mm -hmm. thing is that she she has assumed that she's a part of this group and that she's one of the cool kids now and she's now having to realize that oh these people have history these are these are real people who existed before i showed up yeah and she doesn't particularly like that because it means that when she has opinions there's a chance they're going to be wrong and she's going to get called out and you can see that sasha is really trying to understand like why you know because keith could have told drew to text her you know drew ghosted her the whole night and she's like you know she he could have and he and drew's right here like let's not let's not like do this fight and this is the point you were talking about earlier where eva tries to stop drew and let her know like you know if you're not if you don't feel like you're getting enough respect like you don't deserve this like this ain't worth it and then she's like are you fucking kidding me yep. like you're you're 40 year old who wipes come for money i was like damn <laughs> damn hudson <laughs> yeah oh, man, this, that was this brutal is the other thing to, to go back to uh mini the definitely fictional wink character um she was smart and capable and interesting and people didn't fucking take the time to get to know her or think of her as anything other than this the side piece of this shitty guy mm -hmm. uh, and i wanted to show that hudson like she certainly fills that role and she also can fucking clap back at you with some you know some solid burns because she, there's there's a human life inside there and yeah this is right where things end not fucking cool yeah don't you don't butt in on couple shit and then she's like i'm not 40 and what what a way to end it like i loved it uh, she's just kind of sitting there she's not even processing what they're upset about she's just processing the fact that she got labeled that she's 40. yeah yeah she's 35 it's really important <laughs> <laughs> all right well we are nearing things uh where we need to start wrapping it up let me go ahead and remove this to our main chat now, Richard, I appreciate you coming on here and breaking down the first issue of Haunted Hill. Like, wow, this was such an awesome time. I love hearing just your story first and then seeing how much of that 
like kind of like just the easter eggs within this it was such an awesome experience before we officially end things though i do want to ask you one question and that is for any indie comic creator out there that's been watching this and they're wondering how they themselves can get their own kind of story their own type of haunted hill off the ground and just get going with it what type of advice would you give them from like a creator standpoint to kind of help them push through that barrier well, you have to start reading and writing by the time you're three, and then you have to have published your first book by the time you're seven. Otherwise, <laughs> um, you just just make stuff. Like, I've made a lot of books, and it's because, like, okay, sure, my book was found on a film set, and it was optioned, and that option fell apart, but it, like, showed me that things are possible. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really lucky, but it was also, it was literally my 100th book that was found. So my chances were a hundred times greater than someone who only had one book. Yeah. Um, and that like, there is no, there is no secret magic way. And there's no, it's a, it's a horrible industry where almost anytime someone finds a way in, they close the door behind them. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly don't want to do that to anyone, but the truth is like, I'm 37. I, like some years I make a big pile of money. Some years I make absolutely nothing like some years i have books come out that take off and some years i don't and also like i'm like i've been making a living doing comics for almost two decades and i'm still a person that most people have never heard of um and that's that's really hard to kind of explain you know i think i, I think it's that thing of like you can you can write a script and sell it and the film might make it never get made but you're still a script writer but mm -hmm. you go to a party and people treat you like you're making it up because they've never heard of the thing um yeah just hey, you know it's their loss though because you are an awesome individual i know you said you didn't have many straight friends but you can count me as one of them because Richard, I think, I th honestly, I think you're a pretty badass individual. I love just the inspiration, the motivation to keep continuing and, and writing and, and working through it too. Uh, you know, being legally blind, it has to be challenging to do this art um, in some aspects or maybe even just starting. I'm not trying to assume there, so my apologies if it came off that way, but like the fact that you're working through that and still pumping out is, is remarkable. Well, I mean, like I've, I've been blind since I was born. So it's just always been, you know, uh, drawing things on a flat surface is a much easier mm -hmm. way to interpret the world. Um, and like, yeah, it's, I mean, the other part of it is like, I, I love comics so much. I love making them so much that I'm willing to sacrifice everything else to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, then don't, you don't have to like, no one, no one asked you to do this. Um, and I do work. I mean, Jesus, the past three weeks, I haven't had a day that's been less than 20 hours of drawing or coloring and that's not fun <laughs> well it, you know you got to put the work in that's at the end of the day either you do the work or you don't and whatever you do is going to determine how you get there that's how I, i've always looked at it um and just the amount of work you're putting into it is just it's it's inspirational you know i thought i had a busy day ahead of me because i had two interviews i got a podcast and then i'm looking at another podcast you got two interviews you got two meetings you got a, a, a you got way more on your plate than me like i you know i need to step it up yeah and like by the way there's also the thing of i have so like this year um i had two books that got delayed because of COVID stuff right mm -hmm. and i thought they were just gonna go away but i'm under contract to do them and now the, they've come back and they have to be done. But I'd already taken on all my new work for this year and signed all my new deals for this year. So I suddenly went from having to draw 430 pages or something. I now have to do 988 pages. Oh, no. Art this year. Oh, no. Like, so we're not going to hold you up any longer, Richard, because it sounds like you got to get the drawing. But with that being said, we do need to wrap things up. I have to get ready to break down Doctor Strange in the multiverse of madness. We're going to be doing a nice little podcast, breaking that down and WandaVision as well. So that being said, guys, it is time for us to wrap up. Richard, I appreciate you coming on here, spending every bit of almost two hours breaking down issue number one in your life story. I hope that we can get you back on for all of those new projects. Anything new in the future that you're looking to promote, let's get you back on. Let's break it down. And uh, good. yeah, I appreciate this time. Everyone that's been watching, have an awesome Wednesday. But most importantly, keep it geekly.